Hello. Wanted to welcome you all this afternoon to CSIS. I'm Meredith Broadbent, the Scholl Chair in International Business, and we are doing a broad array of work on development at CSIS this year and next. Today's topic is the, the role of trade capacity building in bringing developing countries into the trading system and promoting economic growth. We are very lucky to have two distinguished speakers. Uh, to my left is Eric Postal, Assistant Administrator, Bureau for Economic Growth, Agri and Trade. Eric is the new Assistant Administrator and he was uh, confirmed uh, by the Senate March 3rd. He's been the founder of Pan Pan Pangea. Pangea Partners, an investment banking and financial services consultancy focused on emerging markets. Its accomplishments include helping six African countries create and improve their stock markets, providing credit and treasury courses to more than 30,000 bankers in developing countries. He served on the HELP Commission and also was uh, formerly a vice president at Citibank in Tokyo. To Eric's left is Steve Bradley, the chief economist of the U.S. Agency for International Development. During 2010, he served as senior advisor to the Secretary of State, where he advised depart the Department on best practices in development and on strategies to strengthen and elevate development across the U.S. government. From 2002 to 2010, we know him as the senior fellow at the Center for Global Development where his work focused on economic growth, poverty reduction, foreign aid, debt, and trade. He's been an advisor to the president of Liberia and was a founding co-chair of the Modern Modernizing Foreign Assistance Network. He's written several books, one of which I just took a look at and read. It's great. You guys have better looking books than we do at CSIS, better pictures, and I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and then today it gives me great pleasure to introduce someone who's just joined us at CSIS, Ambassador Bill Garvelink. He's, a, he's serving as a senior advisor to our U.S. Leadership and Development Program at CSIS. And he comes to us from the Agency for International Development, where he was a senior advisor to Administra Dr Administrator Shaw. And he previously served as Deputy Coordinator for Development at the Presidential Feed the Future. Global Hunger and Food Initiative Secu and Food Security Initiative, where he assumed his duties in May of 2010. From October 2007 to 2010, he served as U.S. Ambassador in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where he managed a staff of 470 and over oversaw a bilateral, multilateral assistance program of more than $900 million. We're glad that Bill is with us um, at CSIS and. We're going to have a, an informal conversation here today. I think I'll let our, our two guest speakers uh, make a few comments, and we will take some questions here on the podium and then uh, go to the audience. So we'll uh, turn to you for some questions as well. Um, but with that, I think we'll start out our discussion to, to see the role of trade capacity building in, in promoting growth and development and getting developing countries involved in the international economy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Now, this is a great, you guys get stars. This is a great turn. Absolutely. Um, we're all very passionate about this subject, and it's great to see others who are very interested in it as well. Um, the uh, USAID and, and Administrator Shaw, the President, the Secretary of, all, of State have all spoken extensively about the centrality of private sector development and economic growth to the entire development endeavor. Uh, there was the Presidential Policy Directive, the QDDR, numerous things that I'm sure many of you are quite aware of. And um, there are many components to operationalizing that, and trade and capacity building for trade is one of them. So um, I'll, maybe I'll speak about that for a couple minutes, and Steve will have other things to add and so forth. But um, as you know, many governments and donor agencies and host countries are working to increase trade. We, we all know uh, the benefits of trade. 
One of the things that the WTO has been trying to do is look at trade capacity building efforts. And this, la this summer in Geneva, they convened all the nations of the world for a series of meetings looking at the effectiveness of trade capacity building. And the United States attended, and we, it was a group of State Department, USTR, and USAID people who went and participated in panels. One of the things that we described in one of those panels was a review of trade effectiveness, trade capacity building programs at USAID. This is the summary. It's on the website. And we, we did an evaluation of all the trade capacity programs that have gone on between 2002 and 2009, about 250 in all, and looked at their effectiveness and looked for lessons learned so that we can improve programs in the future. And we, we rolled that out in Geneva and talked to other donors about what was working and what was not. And basically, people felt that improvements have been made in terms of tr making these programs more effective. More work needs to be done. One of the things that USAID is doing going forward under the leadership of Virginia Brown and her team who are here is to sit with the World Bank and DFID and other donors and look at sh research agendas because we need to keep looking to discover what's truly working, what's not working, and how to make things better. And we hope to s work with them to avoid duplication and fill in cracks <clears throat> and make sure that we're looking at that a lot to uh, improve our projects. A couple of the other interesting things about those meetings and th work going forward was that for the first time the WTO, um, try not to laugh at this, but for the first time the WTO actually had the private sector at the WTO meetings about trade, and it was very effective, and I think everybody realizes that, this, that they really have to be there. And, um, and, and that was really great. And another thing was a lot of discussion about regional trade integration. And of course, within USAID, we're supporting the president's initiatives on the East Africa regional integration. And we have trade hubs in Africa, which are providing assistance on a regional basis there. And we're hoping to build on that in the future. And the Secretary of State spoke about that at the AGOA meetings in Lusaka. Going forward, the WTO is going to have a symposium on implementing reforms in trade facilitation. And we're going to participate and hope that we can work with countries to do even more in those regards, whether it's improving, speeding logistics, um, streamlining on customs, and things like that. So a lot of efforts around trade and trade capacity building to help countries of the world trade more, benefit from that, and thereby drive economic development. So those are a few, th a few of the things that, were, that are happening on the global stage of which we and our interagency partners like the Department of State and USTR have been working and some of the things that we want to try to do going forward, always in partnership with a lot of private sector actors who, who are active in the space. So um, why don't I pause there and turn it over to S Steve to talk about some of the other aspects of private sector development and engagement. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out on a Friday afternoon. Uh, we'll try to pave the way for everybody to go off home for the weekend. Um, uh, the we live at a time of great change in the world and amongst developing countries, both in this year, last year, but over a 10 or 20 year time period and even longer. The last 15 to 20 years have been without question the greatest period for development, uh, economic growth, and poverty reduction in the history of the world. It's not even close to any other period. Uh, with incomes rising, uh, amongst even some of the lowest countries in the world, the number of low-income countries falling sharply, uh, the share of people in the world living under a dollar a day uh, falling for the first time in history, and not just falling, but cutting almost in half in the last 30 years. And trade has been at the center of that transformation. 
Uh, we all know the story of the East Asian miracle countries, but it goes beyond that, uh, where there's a very large number of countries, large and small, big countries and small countries, that have found economic success over the last 15 or 20 years. And it is impossible, really, to find any of them that have been successful without trade being front and center. Uh, that's not to say that free trade has always uh, been at the center of it, but they certainly have found ways to trade and ways to integrate in their regional and global economies. We now face a situation where the United States economy is obviously a bit of a mess. Uh, the European economy is in much better shape, of course. No, they're, they're, folding, <laughs> they're folding fast. Um, and we're seeing a shift of economic power uh, towards, uh, towards the BRICS, towards China, towards India, Brazil, and others. Um, I think that's a very good thing for developing countries, that they have more options uh, and more markets. And we're seeing the presence of, of Brazil and West Africa and Brazil investing in Mozambique. We're seeing, of course, China and India uh, and Indonesia and Malaysia uh, investing across Sub-Saharan Africa and creating new markets and new market opportunities, bringing in technology. Uh, the Chinese <clears throat> investing in new agricultural strains and fertilizers that can be applied in Sub-Saharan Africa. So even though the traditional engines of growth for the world are slowing, new engines are, are uh, arising, which create new opportunities for developing countries uh, around the world. Uh, and trade and, uh, and integrating globally and regionally will be, has to be, at the center. The big challenges for, traditional, for developing countries are to sustain the progress that they've made uh, and uh, to enlarge that progress to other countries that so far have not seen the same kinds of progress. To do that um, requires uh, a, a lot of different things, um, one of which is partnering with the private sector. One of the biggest changes that we have seen in the last 15 years is the incredible rise of private capital flows into developing countries. Some of them foreign capital flows through FDI, remittances, uh, but a lot of them domestic as well, through higher domestic savings rates and greater domestic investment, and greater domestic resource flows. And one of our challenges as, a, as, a, as an aid agency, but as development specialists, is to figure out how we can take advantage, much better advantage, of those private sector capital flows to build trade flows, to build trade capacity, and to sustain economic growth. And we are uh, together, uh, Eric and I, and, and more broadly within the agency, thinking hard about how we can do that, about how we can better take advantage of those opportunities. And it's imperative for us to do so, given the budget climate that we face. We're not going to have a lot of money over the next few years for a big new growth initiative or trade initiative. Uh, we'll be lucky, actually, if we're level funded. So we're going to have to do, uh, uh, we're going to have to do more with less. And that uh, fortunately, we have the opportunity to do that with all these new private flows that are coming in, whether they're, whether they're private investors or whether they're foundations. Um, that means us thinking of ways to cover risks, uh, to, uh, to help nudge countries, uh, companies into more investments, to partner with them, to co-finance in some cases, to, uh, uh, to leverage the investments that they're making, uh, and we're thinking hard about how we can do that. Um, but it has to be much of it centered around encouraging a private investment that will lead to greater, uh, greater trade flows. So uh, let me stop there just as some introductory remarks. Uh, there's lots more that we can touch on in terms of the specifics of what we will do to support growth and also what we'll do to support trade capacity building. But, but that uh, gives you some idea of the kinds of things we're thinking about. Uh, this is the kind of uh, event I like. I don't have to do any work. I can just ask a few questions. And so, so it, it, it's kind of nice. Especially uh, since he doesn't work for the U.S. government. Just say <laughs> well, you know, this week there's been a lot going on at the G20 meetings, and they've talked about a few things other than Greece, I think, maybe not too many. But uh, Bill Gates was there, and he was talking about innovative ways uh, to continue their development work and development process uh, despite all the fiscal constraints that the U.S. and, and other, other countries are, are facing. And last month, uh, the administrator of AID, Administrator Shaw, gave a very interesting speech that talked about uh, economic growth and the importance of the private sector. And uh, to me, this is very interesting, having a long career in AID. I think uh, we all know the development types in years past have seen the private sector primarily as just another funding source. 
and not as a real partner in the development enterprise. And that started to change in, in the past few years in a very positive way. So if I could um, start with a, a question, maybe start with you, Eric, if that's all right. And given the administrator's speech, which I think was on October 20, just a few days ago, could you talk about the, the key elements in USAID that are really going to, to promote uh, this relationship with the private sector? Sure. As an intro to that, let me mention two things relating to the speech, um, which informed the answer. One, if you... Uh, talk to different companies, like let's take an example. If you talk to Walmart, which traditionally, uh, of course, grew as a U.S. business, but now increasingly working internationally, um, they, they've always had, both domestically and internationally, a corporate social responsibility activity, and th they have partnered with organizations such as USAID and DFID and so forth through that arm, through the charitable arm of their activities, which they do for their own business reasons, but it's through that lens of the CSR function. Now they've made an acquisition in Africa. For them, working on women's education <laughs> issues is about educating their future customers and about educating their future employees. For them, working with us or with others uh, to, to help facilitate small farmers growing better products is, is developing their supply chain. So now all of a sudden activities which may be very similar to the kind of developmental activities that we're undertaking is part of their core business. And that's one of the driving, underlying driving forces to to what the administrator is talking about and some of the things that we would do, uh, we, we need to do differently in USAID. Because as you mentioned, Bill, uh, traditionally people were seen as a funding source, but that's, um, but that's really looking at the small piece of what could be a big pie. So w one of the things that we have to start doing differently is deeply engaging with with private sector companies and understanding what they're about and also having a dialogue that's ongoing with them about what we're trying to do developmentally and what they're trying to do in their business. At that same event, the administrator had a dialogue with the CEOs of Cargill, Swiss Re, and um, uh, Merck. And, you know, one of the points that was discussed was that, you know, business will have its objectives and they need to be very clear about what they are, uh, just as we do. But there, there can be, on occasion, points of intersection. And the way to find those intersections is, number one, we have to be offer more transparent access to the private sector. I've, since being sworn in, I've had a number of meetings with individual companies, as well as I'm in the middle of trying to reach out to all 34 trade associations that cover sectors that were that have uh, do a lot of exports to developing countries, and one of the things that they say is that we don't know who to talk to, and that we can solve, and that's one of the things that we have to solve over the next few months, so that it's very clear who they should talk to, and also we have to also loop them in earlier to what we are trying to do, what our strategies are and where we're trying to go. So that, that's one aspect. A few of the other aspects. Um, we, we want to do a lot more with our development credit authority. Some of you may know this is a, a, um, an authority to give guarantees to mitigate risks. The portfolio is currently in excess of a billion dollars. It has a strong track record with small amounts, uh, very low loss rates. And one of the things that it does is uh, bring private capital to bear in areas where they might not have been operating in the past. That's one of the tools we have to work with the private sector to mitigate risks. And um, there's a, a lot more that we can do and are, are ramping up to do in that regard. Uh, the second, another thing is that we, we need to put more people in the field who have investment background and can talk with companies about things like financing, sh sharing risks, and so forth. 
And um, lastly, although not directly with the private sector, we're actively working with OPIC and MCC and TDA to deepen the ties that we've had. We've always worked together, but th they are all about bringing um, private sector capital or an MCC's case, doing projects with the host country that, that remove roadblocks to growth. And so the more that we can work together towards common objectives, we think we can uh, do more to, to foster economic growth, help the countries grow, and, and help private sector expand the business they do. So th those would be some of the things. Okay, if I can uh, continue on to the private sector just a little bit, and then, then we can open up to questions. Again, at the G20, there was a fair amount of discussion about uh, the food security initiative and agriculture and how uh, the, the role of private and public partnerships are very important in those enterprises. And um, I think one of the, one of the, the issues that comes up is, is how to facilitate that in a much bigger way. So I guess as chief economist at uh, AID, and you have other economists working with you, what role do you and your colleagues play? You have a bunch of tools to work with, the Food Security Initiative, Partnership for Growth, and other kinds of initiatives to, to draw the private sector into these relationships and capitalize on, on their expertise and on their resources, which are dwindling on our side of the, the table a bit. Thanks. Yeah, we're trying to employ uh, a number of different resources and tools to try to encourage growth. Some of them are programmatic and some of them are kind of analytic tools. Um, the biggest uh, programs that we have that are growth oriented are number one, the Feed the Future initiative and number two, the Partnership for Growth. The Feed the Future uh, initiative with, with which Bill was uh, intimately involved with uh, in, its, in its setup. Um, uh, is an effort to encourage agricultural production and to improve and strengthen nutrition uh, in countries around the world. And we're focusing on uh, agricultural development plans that countries themselves put forward uh, and are vetted by international experts and then come to us and other donors for funding. Uh, but to the extent that these are focused on agricultural production, they are, of course, focused on economic growth and to a very large extent trade because you can't get agricultural production without uh, going and, and sustaining it without trade uh, and uh, in almost every country that we work in agriculture is is if not the largest sector uh, of, of the economy certainly one of the largest sectors so feed the future is a big a part of what of what we're doing and we're really excited about the, about the progress that's be being made uh, in that initiative the second is the partnership for growth um, which is an attempt for us to uh, change the way we do business in partnering with uh, a small set of countries where the environment is ripe for moving ahead with a growth agenda to help countries make the next big step uh, into, uh, in terms of their economic growth. And we've started with four countries, uh, El Salvador, the Philippines, Tanzania, and Ghana, uh, where we've had a process ongoing for uh, much of, of the last year in working with, uh, with uh, partners within the government to put forward, to go through a diagnostics of what the, what the biggest constraints are to economic growth, what the big issues are, do this jointly, come to an agreement on what the big issues are, and then go forward with a plan of what the government will do, what we will do, and how we will bring other partners in to begin to encourage growth. And we've actually just signed the first of these agreements uh, with the government of El Salvador just earlier this week. Um, and the attempt here is for us to do this as bringing together all the parts of the U.S. government. This is not a USAID initiative, it's a U.S. government initiative. And so as we go to these four countries, uh, it's USAID, State Department, MCC, uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, USTR, uh, and uh, the and the, the many other um, agencies within the U.S. government, OPIC and, and, and others, where we can try to work better because we all know we're not very good within the U.S. government of bringing all these tools together, but uh, but bringing those tools together and working more with with governments. And as we do that, uh, the focus is on how to get the private sector more involved, and much of it focused on how to encourage and increase trade. So th that's at the programmatic level. At the at the level of tools, to be perfectly honest, our ability and our analytic 
capacity as an agency uh, had dwindled, dwindled over the last 15 years uh, for reasons everybody knows. With budget cuts 15 years ago, we lost a lot of staff uh, and cut out a lot of our analytic, uh, our capacity to do analysis and, and to employ analytic tools. We're rebuilding that now. We now do, for example, cost-benefit analysis on all of our Feed the Future programs, which seems pretty straightforward, but we didn't do for a long time. But every single one of our Feed the Future programs is now subject to a pretty thorough cost-benefit analysis. In the Partnership for Growth Countries, working with others within the interagency, we've employed a constraints to growth analysis, which is a growth diagnostics tool um, uh, that was created by, by uh, folks up at uh, Harvard, Ricardo Hausman and Danny Roderick, among others, that we have now employed. Uh, and we are at USAID trying to expand that tool beyond a constraints to growth to thinking about constraints to broad-based growth and inclusive growth. So we're trying to deepen our toolkit um, uh, that way. Um, we're also just uh, doing more macroeconomic analysis for our country team so that we have a better understanding of the broader macroeconomic context and growth context into which all of our USAID program is going. So we're trying to come at this at different levels, at the broad programmatic level, but also just building our toolkit to, to do better diagnostics and analysis. Take that. You want me to go ahead? Um, central, in a word. Um, the the way that the partnership for growth process has been working is that the team, the analytic teams, worked with the host country to try to really hone in on what are the key roadblocks to to growth. And of course, in each country, it was different. But if, if, for example, in a country it was identified that one of the things holding back growth is a lack of power, then, then they've undertaken and they're, or are in the midst of preparing joint action plans about what is it about the power. Are they regulatory issues? Even there, there is an important role for the uh, private sector. We've already, as part of the analytic work, consulted with the private sectors both the local private sectors yeah. as well as U.S. and global private sectors. So for each um, country, we hosted a call where we were getting their input. So not only were we getting the analytical inputs from the economists, but just the folks that have the checkbooks, what do you think are the constraints, to see if they matched up. And they did often match up. But then if the issue is simply insufficient power supply, well, then there's another whole source of engagement with the private sector because then you're not going to necessarily fund that all through downward funding when it, there's, it's a perfectly viable way to do it through, with private sector. And then we would have them, you know, you know, we'd be working with them to see, you know, are, would you be interested to invest and so forth. So there have been already a whole series of consultations and expect that there their full participant and actor in those which lend themselves to private sector solutions. Did you envision U.S. companies being sort of involved in El Salvador, for example, in project build? And I mean, are you close to seeing how that will happen? Um, I think it will vary. But um, because, for instance, to give an example, one of the constraints in El Salvador is security. Um, when we talked to private companies, they had some pretty uh, amazing stories to talk about how security is impeding their business, where you have banks that had to shut branches because of security and problems with getting their employees home safely and things like that. So in something like that, less so. But in then certain other areas, more so. So they're, as they, they just signed the action plan, and now they'll set in to start working out the pieces the puzzle and talking to to private sector folks when applicable. Um, Erica, you had led the U.S. delegation to the third um, review of aid for trade in the WTO. And what was your sense of, of the meetings there and how successful is the WTO being on capacity building and aid for trade? Um, the, what we saw was that progress is being made because, uh, I, as this predates my involvement, but I understand that initially uh, the discussions were about the quantity of aid for trade. Right. Um, you know, that's all well and good, but then is it effective is the more important 
point. So when we, when we um, at this meeting, the, there were, and, and in the lead up to it, there was a, a lot of analysis done by um, different parties about, well, how effective is it? And the answer was good, but room for improvement. So that, that's one whole outcome is to, to focus more on that and, um, and, and to, to have more improvement and also to do more on the regional trade subject that um, there was too much going on in terms of bilaterally and that it would be great if we could do more on a regional basis. And so I think a number of donors took that to heart and certainly the private sector participants argued for that, that that needs to be factored in much more. Are there particular uh, programs that, that, that typically promote regional integration or trade among, among regions as opposed to bilateral approaches? So um, the comments that I made, and Steve may have some others, is that um, transport and customs, those two are certainly two key ones because, um, you know, you've seen regional integration. Um, they already mentioned, but let's talk about the EU and what happened during accession of the countries when there was a better, freer movement of goods and services. So one is just how long does it take to get through the border and regulatory things because sometimes people have had different regulatory regimes and so then you need multiple sets of packaging or whatever it might be, paperwork or testing so that you can sell the product in all, you know, all the countries in a region. And then, and then another whole area is transport. Um, do, do you have the right, um, the roads in the pla right places to move goods and services between the countries? Because you know, in some areas, everything was oriented to get the stuff off the count. You know, you, you have products and you want to sell that products to other to people in other continents. And so it was easier to get it out of the continent than it was within, get it around inside the continent. So I think those are the two that I'd call out, but Steve might have some other things yeah. to add. Uh, at a different level, you're thinking about regional organizations and, and their role. Um, and there are lots of regional organizations from ASEAN to SADC uh, to uh, the East African community and, and, and many others. Um, and I, those, institutions play a role, for sure, as a forum to bring people together um, and uh, uh, for discussions on everything from trade tariffs to standards to trade facilitation, everything else around that. Um, sometimes I think, however, uh, they uh, attract too much attention in terms of the mechanisms to promote trade and regional integration. Uh, and I think sometimes there's automatically a, res a response to go and work through those institutions. And to be honest, some have been effective, but a lot have not been very effective. Um, and so what we're beginning to see is a lot more, a, a lot of integration happening outside of those agencies, whether it's bilateral through trade corridors with uh, Tanzania connecting by road down to Zambia, or whether it's regional electricity grids uh, or uh, or different kinds of forms of integration that are happening uh, because it makes business sense and because uh, uh, companies want to do it and they encourage their governments to do it uh, and you can get a lot of integration uh, that way as well. So I just don't want to equate the regional organizations as the only mechanisms for, for deep, deepening regional trade and integration. They have a role, but actually a lot of the, the really interesting work is being done outside of those. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think, um, obviously, the main thing is we try to look at what, uh, when we do the projects, to what extent are they leading to increased exports and things like that. So, for example, um, in the review of the USAID programs, they did regression analysis that led to uh, the prediction that based on the history that for every dollar that was spent on trade capacity uh, projects, it was leading to $42 increase in exports two years later. 
So, you know, ultimately that's, that's the main driver, which is did exports grow? And so we try to focus on that. Obviously, we have metrics about just the cost effectiveness and other things of, of the actual projects, but that's on a less macro level and more internal. The, the volume of trade is key. The speed with which uh, trade shipments move through ports on both imports and exports uh, is critical. Looking at tax revenues that are generated both on the import side and the export side, not at all implying that uh, greater tax revenue is always better. Often it's not better, especially on the export side. Uh, but you've got to have a, a handle on the revenue that's uh, generated um, uh, by that. Uh, those are the kinds of things that, that I think we're most interested in, is looking at the volume of trade and the speed uh, that the trade uh, moves through uh, moves through the port. At a different level, you, you also want to look at the capacity for countries to engage in, in trade negotiations and how you measure exactly that human capital of a country's ability to sit down with other countries and negotiate. Uh, tariffs or standards or regulations is really hard, actually. It's not just the number of people. It's certainly not how many PhDs or JDs or anything else they have. Uh, but we recognize that the human capital is necessary. And to be honest, we're kind of looking for ways to measure that human capital capacity uh, that is more indicative of the final process. Too often, we just look at number of people trained and stuff like that. And to be honest, that's not satisfactory. That's a hard puzzle. Uh, and we'd certainly be open for ideas of how we can track that kind of stuff at a, at a better level. The, the broader goals are clear of, of trade volumes and trade and speed uh, and, and uh, the throughput. Uh, the intermediate goals of how to get there are frankly harder, harer to measure. We're concerned about making sure that countries adopt international-based standards so that our, our companies can be competitive and not more of a standard that was uh, typical in Europe. Are we working that into our programs that are, are doing capacity building for countries to teach them how to come into compliance with standards and, and SPS and these type standards? Um, absolutely on regulatory. That's a big part of the programs. And uh, for instance, our work in the regional trade hubs in Africa and under AGOA, it, that is a big part of it, is helping them uh, understand and comply with regulatory requirements like SPS and so forth. Um, so, so that is definitely part of it. We, we have worked closely with them, but and because the tr aid for trade agenda is also important to what they're trying to do. In the lane of the pure trade negotiations, we leave that to USTR. But in, t in terms of the aid for trade agenda and how that is an integral piece of it, then we're h hand in glove on it because it's so interrelated. I just have one question I'd like to ask because uh, I know what you guys have been up to recently. <laughs> and uh, you just got back last week from Afghanistan and looking at aid activities there, and there's a lot of changes underway in Afghanistan with troop reductions and the, and the offing and these sort of things. And to return a bit to the private sector, from your uh, review of the aid activities and the progress there, is, any, is there a way or a method to engage the private sector in a bigger way or a different way to hopefully maintain the economic growth that, that has happened in Afghanistan recently? Um. Eric and I spent last week in uh, Afghanistan. It was an incredibly fascinating uh, trip. We were mostly in Kabul. We spent a day out in Herat, out in western Afghanistan. Um, even without the major security and conflict issues, uh, Afghanistan is one of the most difficult development puzzles and challenges in the world, if not the most difficult. It's landlocked, uh, surrounded by uh, <coughs> Pakistan and Iran and Turkmenistan and, and several other uh, countries that are, are, I don't think would make anybody's top 10 list of trade partners. Um, it is uh, uh, essentially a, a mountainous, arid uh, uh, highlands desert with very little fertile land, uh, very difficult to grow things. And the southern plains a little bit more, but up in the mountains, very difficult. 
So the kind of traditional avenues for production and therefore trade around agriculture and uh, labor-intensive manufactured exports are really, really difficult when you're in a landlocked mountainous <laughs> desert region. Um, and then when you throw in the security issues on top of that, um, it really makes it uh, probably the most difficult development challenge in the world. I was certainly surprised, uh, having said that, at the extent of vibrant private sector activity, uh, both in where we saw in Kabul and, and, and in Herat. There are businesses all over the place that are moving, that are producing things, uh, where there's a lot of activity and, and a lot of employment. Uh, GDP has been growing uh, uh, over the last 10 years in, uh, in Afghanistan by 6% uh, or more, so over a decade. Uh, haven't quite doubled GDP, but getting close. Um, and you can see it in uh, activities all over the place. Agriculture is growing despite the difficulties, particularly where there's uh, irrigation. Um, small and medium enterprises are thriving in certain parts of the country and producing all kinds of stuff. We went to two industrial parks. There was one in, in Kabul where there were 32 firms that were, uh, had filled the zone, uh, had filled the park. There were over 100 firms on the waiting list to try to get in. And uh, they were making, there was a printing company, there was a textile company, there was a Coca-Cola bottling plant. There were all kinds of different, um, uh, different factories. Uh, that employed, we don't, we never got a full number, at least I didn't, but several thousands, how many? 2,000 in that, in that plant, plus the Coca-Cola bottling yeah. plant, so, which was actually outside, so 2,500 or more uh, employees in, in the plant. Uh, so it shows that there is potential um, uh, that for private sector activity. We came away really thinking that the, that the potential for this had to be either in agriculture and increasing irrigated, uh, irrigated agriculture, um, where the yields are twice that for rain fed, uh, and, and for um, focusing uh, investments around small and medium enterprises, private sector growth around a range of, 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 of SMEs and thinking along strategies where we could work with industrial parks or corridors to supply power, finance, training, uh, and other kinds of support to really get these, uh, these activities going. USAID actually helped build the industrial park in Kabul uh, and is providing other kinds of support along the way. So we did, uh, at least in my view, find some examples where there was more hope. Having said that, however, uh, security remains a big issue. The day after we left, there was a suicide bombing in Kabul that killed a lot of people, including a number of American troops. And the industrial park that we visited in Herat was, was victimized by an attack on, I think, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday night. So uh, it's not easy. Um, I also, we also met with a group of women uh, entrepreneurs um, who were some of the most courageous um, and energetic people I've ever met that were, despite the toughest odds that you can imagine, were either uh, in business themselves or were supporting uh, other businesses and were optimistic about the future and were, were, were showing uh, that things can, can get done even, even where things don't cost money. I'll, I'll give one example. I spoke to a woman who runs an organization that tries to encourage more women uh, being able to sell their products in markets. If you go to any of the markets, it's mostly men that do the selling, even if the women are doing the producing. And so she got together and organized a bunch of women uh, that would have one day in the market where it would be a women's day where they could sell their goods. Uh, and they gathered that morning, and the men from nearby didn't like the fact that a bunch of women <laughs> were gathering uh, uh, and weren't exactly sure what was going on. I think they thought it was <laughs> an offshoot of Occupy Wall Street, Occupy, Co Occupy Cobble, I guess. Um, and so at first they met a lot of resistance of what are you doing out here and is this some kind of threat? Uh, but instead of reacting badly to it, they went and sat down with uh, some, of the, 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 some of the men, some of the elders, and explained what they were doing and explained that they were just trying to provide incomes for their family. And once they sat down and talked it through, the men said, oh, that's a great idea. In fact, we'll help you and we'll make sure that you have the protection you need and all of that. So uh, it's too bad that they actually had to seek the permission of men. But when they did it, they were actually able to, to, to move forward and now there are over 600 uh, women involved in uh, these once a month market days where they can sell their goods and, and, and keep all the income. So there are snippets of, of where you can get some progress. I don't know if you want to add anything to that or not. Good. 
Well, I'll turn it over to the audience here. We've got some questions. Um, do we have a? Why don't you bring it up here? Just introduce yourself and try to keep it quick. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, to what extent are you able to use the internet to get in the private sector and get more transparency so everybody sees what's happening? Um, do we want to take two or three questions, or do we want to answer them one? We can do that. Yeah. Want to do two or three? Sure. Justin Tinsey with the Corporate Council in Africa. Um, my question is about what I call the dragon in the room, and that's China. Um, I was wondering in what ways do you think the U.S. can learn from China in promoting uh, U.S. investment overseas in emerging economies, particularly maybe with USAID's collaboration with MCC, XM Bank, um, and OPIC? Okay, we'll, we'll take one more on this side and then we'll go to the other side. Go ahead. Um, Ashley Lubankoff, uh, I'm doing research and consulting right now. I was wondering, in terms of how we're getting more involved in trade in the private sector in Afghanistan, how far along are we in the infrastructure to build that up, um, and how far behind are we on infrastructure in order to continue on a trade program? <coughs> Great. Hi. We've got three questions there. And so I'll, I'll do talk about two of them. First, in terms of the internet, um, we uh, obviously that's a very, very important area, and internet access varies country to country. And so USAID certainly is focused on it. We have an I, uh, ICT team that is focused on it. One of the things we're interested to try to do going forward is that there are, in a, in a number of countries, they have something called um, universal access funds. And there's actually a lot of money in those. There are fees that are collected from users, and the countries have these pots of money. And we're hoping to work with the countries to unlock that. We saw in Afghanistan that internet uh, prices are very high. And um, sometimes in these business parks, that's part of the services out in Herat. We, one of the endeavors includes providing faster internet because you had a bunch of basically budding entrepreneurs coming out of the university, particularly the computer sciences part of the university, who um, had a bunch of different ideas for building businesses, but one of the whole b things holding them back was uh, internet, they need fast internet supply uh, service. So, so absolutely it's an important, important area. As far as the infrastructure in, in Afghanistan, it's very important. There are, have been a number of efforts in that area. There's a whole huge multinational, multilateral effort to build a ring road right around the entire, right through the whole country, but a giant circle. And um, they're on to the last, I think it's maybe 150 kilometers or so. You've got to have roads to be able to trade and, and uh, increase commerce. Obviously, it's, it's, that's one of the most dangerous activities out in the rural areas is building those roads um, in, in some of the areas where security is very challenging. But um, roads and power are both central. And w one of the things that w we feel is that um, it will be particularly important to focus the infrastructure on the areas where there's good, better job creation prospects, because it really doesn't isn't ideal if you if you support the creation of a business uh, industrial zone and then they don't have power or their power comes on and off and it's unreliable. So infrastructure is essential in Afghanistan for growth. Uh, just on Justin's question about uh, about China, um, China creates both challenges but also great opportunities for developing countries. Uh, and of course, it's not just China. It's uh, the rise of a, of a, of a fairly large number of, of uh, middle-income countries, the BRICS, the Brazil, and, and, and India and China and, and Russia to some extent, but also, as I mentioned, Indonesia, Malaysia, and a lot of other, uh, South Africa, a lot of other emerging middle-income uh, middle countries that provide uh, tremendous opportunities. And 
Those opportunities are, are regionally based, uh, where you see a lot of growth in, in southern Africa around South Africa's engine, uh, and uh, we see growth in Southeast Asia around, around China as well. Um, China is also obviously playing a big role as a donor. Uh, I think many of the donor organizations on the ground make a mistake by excluding China from a lot of their discussions and deliberations. Um, and I think the more that we can begin to include China as a member of donor groups uh, and, and think about partnering with them, um, uh, the better. In Liberia, where I spent a lot of time, we, the United States worked with, and I wasn't working for USAID at the time, but uh, USAID partnered with the Chinese government, with the Chinese um, uh, uh, built a hospital, and we uh, helped provide all the supplies uh, to the hospital and some of the supporting infrastructure. And it was a, a very well-planned, joint, coordinated uh, effort, and the Liberians were delighted, and there's an operating functional hospital uh, as a result. Um, and so a lot of it is, is kind of getting over fears and preju prejudices and figuring out where there are uh, our, our common agendas. Um, you know, in some countries, the story is far from rosy, uh, where um, uh, some Chinese companies are, are uh, looking to extract resources and, um, and are less interested in long-term development. Um, and I think that's especially true, frankly, in, co in countries that are not as well governed, when you've got countries that are run by more, dict uh, more dictators or unaccountable governments, there's more opportunities for Chinese firms or any other firms to abuse those kinds of situations. But the more where we're finding more democratic and, and accountable governments that are committed to open procurement standards and that kinds of things, we have opportunities uh, where Chinese companies are competing and where we can partner with them. So I think it's very context specific, um, but there are a lot of opportunities there for us as an aid agency to partner and also for private companies to partner that it, we're not yet fully taking advantage of. Okay, let's do three more questions. And we'll start, go around this side, guys. My name, is, uh, My name is Khalid Mastry with Standard Associates. Uh, my question is, uh, what uh, programs, if any, does the USAID plan to do uh, to harmonize standards among regions, especially in the MENA region uh, and the United States? Uh, we know that there's a lot of these standards being harmonized with Europe, and that's to the disadvantage of the U.S. economy. Let's see, who else do we have? That lady there. Ashley Tokic from the Joint Un um, Economic Committee in the Senate. I was wondering if you can talk about the Partnership for, partnership for Growth and how you're gonna leverage other money that's going to other USAID programs on a, in the same areas towards the goals of the partnership. If you can talk about how to leverage other money and financing that we're giving. Good. It's economic times. And then uh, Ambassador Samuels at the back there. Uh, my name is Michael Samuels. Uh, first of all, in front of everyone, Meredith, I want to congratulate you on your nomination today. It was made public by the White House <laughs> about you. a half hour before uh, this meeting started, and I congratulate you very much. Thanks. Uh, a comment. Um, as someone who's watched capacity building for um, since its beginning in a trade-related fashion, I found myself in the early days quite critical of USAID for really not paying much attention to it and yet trying to package almost everything else it did in developing countries as somehow being trade-related. Now, if I listen to today, what I hear is uh, you're trying to package all that you're doing related to the expansion of uh, the private sector, which I congratulate, and I think is important, and a variety of other things, some of which is important for food security and things like that, but you seem to also do it in a way that kind of ignores trade capacity building. And I wonder whether we're slipping back into an era when AID tries to justify almost anything it does as being trade capacity building, because I don't really see you talking about it directly. Um, on the harmonization question, 
I'm, I'm not an expert in that area, so I don't think I can give you a full, complete answer. But um, I think it depends on the situation and the country specifically. In other words, um, we try to be responsive to what the country is interested in doing. And obviously, in, um, in many cases, that is, is working with them in terms of harmonizing to U.S. standards and regulations. I think there probably are some cases where th if, the, if they're trading, if, if ni just to pick a theoretical example, if 90% of their trade is with Europe and 10% is with us, obviously to the extent that we try to be, to do country-led development, then we have to have another discussion because it may be that the bulk of their trade work is with them and so we, we may have to work on on sort of a mixture or a blend of things depending on the scenarios. But country by country, I, I'm not knowledgeable enough to be able to say on that basis. Um, f for the ambassador's comments, um, I'm, I certainly didn't mean to imply that there was a blend of everything. We, we have robust programs on trade capacity building. The Secretary of State, as you may know, made a renewed commitment to trade capacity building in Africa. And I, I have not been part of any discussions where anybody thinks that we are backing away from that, number one. Number two, um, trade is one part of private sector engagement, but obviously we're, we're doing lots of other things on private sector engagement that aren't trade. We're, we're, we're trying to do both. So, for instance, in terms of spurring private sector, there's a whole, we didn't touch on much yet about all the work that we, AID has traditionally done about business enabling environment. And um, whether it's time to incorporate or helping um, improve the rule of commercial law, um, a whole host of things like that. And so wh whether it's, so there are multiple components in terms of the engagement. And um, we will continue to, to do things on trade. And there are, um, there are some things that are pure trade capacity building and that people might think of trade. There are other things that maybe some people consider under that rubric you mentioned about um, you know, packaging or labeling everything that way. I mean, I think the classic example is buy um, I don't know if it's OECD or W, it's probably WTO. They, for instance, class, you know, there's a lot of road projects that are considered trade capacity building because they do contribute to trade. But they're also roads and the roads are used for other things. So there is that element under WTO of what gets counted or not. But, but you're absolutely right that um, we shouldn't back away from trade capacity building. And by the same token, we shouldn't pretend that all private sector engagement is trade capacity building. And then lastly, there's a whole bunch of other private sector engagement that needs to be done, is being done, and will be approved, improved upon that is, stands on its own outside of the, the trade um, part of it. Steve. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, you know, there's nothing in what we've said that suggests any backing away from trade capacity building. I'm not quite sure where you, you would have heard that. But it is important to recognize that trade capacity is not the goal, and trade is not the goal. Economic growth, job creation, income growth, and poverty reduction are the goals. And trade and is a means towards that in any country, and trade capacity is, is a means towards those goals as well. And so in terms of our work and our thinking, we need to put it into those contexts of the ultimate goals that we're trying to achieve and how we can bring together all of the tools across the U.S. government to uh, achieve those goals. Um, and trade is, as I said several times right at the beginning, is central to all of that and continues to be pretty central to all of our, our, our thinking. Uh, Ashley, on, uh, on your question um, in terms of leveraging other uh, funding for PFG, PFG in and of itself, as you know, doesn't actually have any money. And so the whole idea is to leverage all of the other tools, whether it's USAID or uh, other things as well. And one of the things we're trying, for example, that we're trying to, to work on is uh, over time bringing together uh, MCC uh, 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 compacts and our Feed the Future work so that they can be jointly complementary of each other in terms of achieving goals. 
Uh, that's not an easy thing to do, especially since the MCC compacts wisely are on a five-year time frame, but that also means we can't just change them on a dime. Uh, and so it's going to take a little bit of time, but we are working very closely with the MCC and our Feed the Future folks to see how we can make sure that these things uh, complement uh, each other. Uh, and then we bring in our other tools as well, uh, possibly the Development Credit Authority, the DCA, uh, uh, certainly our, our, uh, our um, advisory work on policy, whether it's on, uh, whether it's on trade policy or private sector policy, business <coughs> environment, our training programs, access to finance. And what we're really trying to do in Partnership for Growth is bring all of those things together in a much more coherent way. So, for example, uh, in Tanzania, where President Kikwete has put as a very high priority building the, the, the trade quarter, the agricultural trade quarter that runs uh, southwest through Tanzania down to the Zambian border, uh, some of that is, is infrastructure, which perhaps we might finance, or perhaps we'll be looking to the World Bank, actually, or the African Development Bank to finance some of the infrastructure. Uh, we would be bringing in through Feed the Future um, uh, investments around agriculture, agricultural extension, policy advising, stuff like that. We might bring in a DCA, Development Credit Authority, uh, to help small and medium enterprises uh, that are, are nearby. Uh, we would be working to help uh, in terms of trade capacity building, in terms of helping to facilitate those flows across that border and then through the, uh, through the port. Um, so that's exactly what we're, the whole idea is actually that it's not a pot of money, but it's a better use of the existing streams of money around a common goal, working with the government and other partners to achieve those goals. Hope, we'll see if we can achieve it. It's, it's not easy, but that's, that's the idea. Okay. Let's see, um, maybe in the center section here. Um, up here, guys. Uh, hi, I'm Robbins Pancake, uh, formerly with uh, HP and Agilent Technologies. Um, one of the problems that, and so I have the benefit of uh, a lot of global experience um, on the private sector side, and one of the things, or several of the things that we often ran into in terms of problems were uh, lack of commercial law, uh, corruption, uh, in fact, trade facilitation issues, customs clearance, et cetera. And so, and my question is, um, I know there's, uh, that uh, Secretary Clinton's been promoting the Civilian Response Corps um, and what I would call more infrastructure related, but not just trade uh, in terms of infrastructure. Um, is that a group that, that uh, you work with and, and coordinate with in terms of solving some of these, um, uh, I guess, more, more endemic problems, uh, particularly in the developing world, so that so that when you get to the point of, of uh, being able to trade, uh, you have an infrastructure that, that works. Great, I think there's one in the back there, he's got it. Hi, uh, Ralph Watkins with the International Trade Commission. Uh, recently there was a report that India is thinking about uh, building a railroad from central Afghanistan to a port in Iran uh, for the purpose of extracting uh, mineral resources from uh, central Afghanistan. Is the United States going to have a problem with India partnering with Iran? Okay, there's three questions. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Let's see, I guess there should be one more. Sure. Hi. Carol Grigsby, Independent Development Advisor. Um, I. I was interested in the discussion on the public-private partnerships front and fully agree that getting uh, the private sector in on the ground uh, at the strategy level is the right thing to do. Uh, but I was interested in any thoughts that uh, either uh, you, Eric, or Steve might have on what the responsibilities are on the private sector side in partnering with the U.S. government on uh, development and if there are any, uh, any if any emerging best practices that you see on the private sector side. Thank you. So um, on, the, uh, on, on the first question, um, we are, again, trying to look for all of the different aspects and all of the different tools um, that are possible to bring to bear on 
on, uh, on trade. It's not at all clear the extent to which the Civilian Response Corps can feed into that or not, because it's a developing idea and it's not clear exactly what the focus of that program will be. Um, but the key thing is for us to look imaginatively and creatively across all of, all of what we've got at USAID, at OPIC, MCC, state, and elsewhere on a particular problem. What we don't want to do is start with a particular tool, tool and find a use for it, because if, if I've got a hammer, I can find lots of uses for a hammer, but rather turn it around and look country specific at individual situations and problems and see what we've got that we can bring together uh, to solve the problem. So that may or may not play a role depending on the country context. Uh, on the, the India, uh, Afghanistan, Iran, I, I actually don't know the particular project you have in mind, but having visited uh, Herat in the southwest, um, a large portion a significant portion of Herat's in that whole region's uh, uh, economic base um, is through uh, uh, trade and economic integration with Iran. Um, it would be foolhardy for us in any way to try to discourage or stop that because um, it wouldn't be good for the people of Afghanistan, uh, uh, nor would it be good for our long-term uh, objectives. Um, having said that, we're also not in a position to step in and actively promote uh, and, and, and do much to, to actively uh, encourage. So I don't know anything about the particular example of an Indian railroad, uh, of India building a railroad from central Afghanistan down to, uh, to Iran, so I can't comment specifically on that. But I think I can say that we are certainly open to uh, all ideas and, uh, and all uh, avenues through which economic activity can be sustained and accelerated in Afghanistan. So. Uh, Carol, as far as your question, um, you know, I think one of the big things is for the private sector to be very clear about what their objectives are. And, um, you know, we don't have, it's fine to say we're in business to make money and that's what our objective is, but here's how you're your meaning USAID or State Department, who, whoever the partnerships are with, here's how your objectives overlap with ours and we can each have a win out of it. That sounds sort of processy and silly, but sometimes, um, you know, that lack of clarity and acknowledgement about what's happening leads to spinning wheels and things like that. So I, I think that's one thing going forward. And then another thing that I think, um, that actually builds on that is for the USAID part that we, we have to start, um, we have to be more strategic about the partnerships because um, we have many partnerships and many of them have proven to be very, very successful. But as uh, under the, the administrator's leadership of trying to have very strong strategic focus in all, our, in all the sectors and in all the countries, then all our programming is meant to ha drive towards high impact, high outcomes in the on sectors or countries. So then that shapes the partnerships. And so we'll have to have that back and forth dialogue because it may be that that a particular parts of the private sector are interested in things that are important, but they may not be things that USAID is focusing on or State Department or MCC. But you know the the whole issue of private sector engagement and partnership is, is actively being worked on all over the world. Um, and so there's DFID and there's the World Bank and there's so many other people, the Chinese, I mean, we, 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 um, whatever it might be. So I think those are some of the things that are evolving. Great. Unless there are any final questions, I want to just thank Steve and Eric for their time this afternoon and thank you all for spending your Friday afternoon with us. We really enjoyed it and join me in thanking the panel. <laughs> <laughs>